I know I always start every message with this, but there are Bibles over there that are useful. That's a bit of an understatement, really. Said so the Bible is useful, isn't it? But if you've got one, really helpful. Um, Matthew 10, and amazing how, I don't know if you find this, God does this all the time, where actually you, um, you might think it's planned, but it doesn't kind of always work that way. But actually, you just, you know, the names that have just been shared, people that are on our hearts, people that we're thinking about. And then the passage that we happen to be at this morning, which it could obviously be anything if you think about it, um, happens to be about some of those verses where God knows how many hairs are on our head, that God knows us intimately, that what Carl's just said, the God of the universe knows how many hairs or lack of hairs are on every single one of our heads. Isn't that amazing? And uh, we're going to just look at that a little bit this morning. This is a part of Matthew chapter 10. And uh, in Matthew chapter 10, he's dealing with uh, the first Christian kind of disciples of Jesus are being sent out on their first mission, their first kind of exercise, if you like, without Jesus to go and spread this good news. We know that as Christians, uh, one of the things we're to do or the main thing we're about is bringing glory to God. And we do that best by sharing the glory of God by telling people of how awesome this God is that we serve. And uh, these verses from Matthew 10 are dealing directly with that, what it looks like to be a sheep amongst wolves, which was last week, what it looks like to navigate the trials of this world whilst following Jesus. Because this world is opposed to that. We know that, don't we, right? That actually to follow Jesus is to go against what the rest of the world is doing. That actually to be a follower of Jesus is the hard path. Not the easy path, it's not the easy way, it's not a quick fix, but it's, it's the hard path to follow after him. And so there's these verses, uh, verses 26 through to 31, and uh, they deal with the day-to-day reality of what it means to follow after Jesus. And you'll notice that three times in verse 26, I think it's verse 28 and verse 21, Jesus says something like, fear not, or don't fear, or have no fear. So the whole purpose of this passage, if you like, is saying, well, actually, when I'm out there in the world, when I'm doing my thing, when I'm taking hits for following Jesus, actually, the big kind of opposition, you like, is often from ourselves in fearing, fearing what others might say or fearing what others think of me. And it kind of paralyzes sharing the hope we have in Jesus, doesn't it? And that's why sometimes it's so great to come together on a Sunday because it, Carl used that word recalibrate, it does, it resets us on to actually, no, I serve a great God. I can do this. I can share the hope I have in Jesus with people. Not because I'm awesome, but because I have a God who's awesome. And uh, there are different things I thought about in my own little journey um, when it came to stopping me from sharing my faith. You have lots of opportunities, don't we, at different times of our life to share our faith and sometimes we take that opportunity and other times we don't and I was just dwelling upon the reasons that maybe I haven't done in the past and maybe when I was a little bit younger I wouldn't share even if I was given the opportunity because I wanted to be popular. The reality was I was already pretty unpopular in school. Um, Although I was on the sports teams which gets you kudos and cool points, um, I was also in chess club. So got kind of a bit of a dig for that. I I wasn't the coolest kid, can you believe? I know that's hard to believe looking at me now. Um, But I didn't want to be in the minority. And so when it came to sharing my faith, which I knew was a minority view, I didn't want to be more unpopular than I already was. So fear stopped me from doing that. Or when I was a little bit older in the workplace, uh, I was thinking, well, is it unprofessional for me to share my faith in certain contexts? And so you go down the line of, well, I'll just do it gently little bit at a time, little bit at a time. And it starts as a great plan. But you know what? The longer you leave it, the harder it gets. I think, well, I've known this person now for five years and I still haven't said anything about my faith in Jesus. And it becomes even harder. Whereas actually, if you meet someone for the first time, it's almost easier to go in and say, hi, I'm Dan, I'm a Christian. I don't do that, by the way. <laughs> but it w- that would be easier in many ways. Because I think we assume I'd, wrongly that we live in a Christian country still. We don't, and actually people don't know I'm a Christian necessarily, they should do, but they don't know necessarily by looking at my life that I follow Jesus. I don't think we shine as brightly as we think we do in the world, which means we don't necessarily say stuff, so we fear maybe getting it wrong, or people kind of, you know, not wanting to spend any time with us, or even harder, I think, in many ways, is with our own family. 
You know, I'm blessed in that members of my family, my parents, uh, follow after Jesus, and that's great. But then there are other parts of my family where they don't. And you know what? Having faith conversations is really hard, isn't it? And the longer you leave it, the harder it gets, almost. And I, I find this particularly with my brothers. I don't, I don't think they'll mind that this is on the internet. That's okay. But the, they know what I do, so the how's work conversation doesn't come up very often. They don't want to know because they don't want to get onto those conversations. So it's one of those like, we all know that you believe this and I believe this, but we won't talk about it. It's almost something that you talk about everything else in the world except that. And so I kind of try and steer it there, but it doesn't always go so well. But in all these different environments, whether it's with our family, with our friends, with a complete stranger, sometimes the reason we don't share is we're paralyzed by fear. Paralyzed by the what if. What if it goes wrong? What if I don't know what to say, which incidentally God deals with earlier on in this chapter. But he deals here with, I think, what it looks like and, and this fear idea. Jesus here wants his disciples to be fearless. Doesn't want them thinking, oh no, what if? Or what's that person going to think of me? And so he gives some helpful instructions, I think. This is reading from verse 26. And by the way, in the two verses that have just gone before this, he says something to the effect of, I'm not direct quoting this, but he says, the people have been calling me Satan. So if you're going to identify with me, then you're going to get some stick too. So that's the context of what he goes on to say. He says this, have no fear of them. So he's talking about people that give you a hard time for sharing your faith or worse than giving you a hard time in many countries in the world where people actually lose their lives for following after Jesus. And it says, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. It's really cheery, isn't it, that for a Sunday morning? You think, oh Jesus, why did you have to put that line in there at the end? It was going so well. And I think one of the fears, I, I've come up with three, but I'm not going to mention the third one. The, but I'll do it another time, I think. But the first two in particular. And the first one, that I think the reason we have fear, and I think Jesus deals with here is, we fear that we'll never see justice. We fear that somehow, even though we might be in the right and sharing what's in the right, that actually the things that are done to us, the, the hurt and the pain, the wrongs will never be righted. The injustices will never be met. And so we fear that. We fear our reputation. We fear what the world has to say of us. Maybe we fear being shouted down or told no. And Jesus' encouragement is here is that things that happen in the darkness, the stuff that is said to us, the hits that we take for following after Jesus, which there will be. Some of you even right now might be thinking, oh, I've had a bit of a bruising week. I've had a bit of a bruising year. We can say that still, can't we? Because we're only a couple of weeks into 2017 still. So. The things that happen in the darkness will be brought into the light. All things hidden, church, will one day be known. Is that good? I think that's amazing. All the things that are in the darkness, all the injustice, all the wrongs will be righted. I know we mentioned, I'm not going to get into the whole politics thing, but politics isn't going to wrong all the rights. There's only one person who's going to wrong all the rights, and his name's Jesus. Right all the wrongs. Right all the wrongs. Thank you, Grace. Wrong all, he's not going to wrong rights, is he? He's going to right all the wrongs. Brilliant. And all the things that happen in secret will be brought into the light. Last weekend, um, I went on a little visit with my dad and my brother to Poland, and everyone said, oh, was it really good? And I said, yes, it was really good. But we went to Auschwitz, um, which is, for those that don't know, the, the largest concentration camp that the Germans had in Poland, well, in, in the world, actually, uh, during the Second World War. And over a million people lost their lives or were killed cruelly in that place. And uh, two days before they were liberated by the Soviets in 1945, the Germans in Birkenau went round the whole camp and they tried to destroy everything. They knocked everything down, they took as much stuff out as they could. Why? Because they were trying to cover up their wrongs. They were trying to n not be known what they'd done. The, the world watching on wouldn't know what had happened in that place. Fortunately, they didn't do a very good job of clearing up their mess so that we know and we can look back and we can say, 
oh wow, this is what happened here. Let it never happen again. All the things that happen in the darkness, whether on a grand scale like that or on a personal level to you, will be brought into the light. 1 Corinthians 4 says, The Lord will bring to light the things now hidden in the darkness and will disclose all the purposes of the heart. The heart being your very soul, your very core as a person. All the things we say, all the things that are done towards us. And there's a whole heap of stuff that every single one of us here has and is personal to us. Maybe they're things that have been said to us on account of us following Jesus. Maybe it was many years ago and it stuck to us and it hurts. All those things will be brought into the light. And God knows this. That's what I find so encouraging. God knows the things that are said in the darkness towards us. God knows about those things. We know about them, but so does he. And one day they will all be made right. And we need courage. We need faith. We need strength. We need patience. And we need perseverance. But you know what he's talking about here when he says all the wrongs will be righted? is on that last day. And that last day could be a little while still. It's not right now in this moment this morning, I don't think. That Jesus is the one who brings that transformation on that last day, but can bring it in the moment to now. And so I think Jesus here says, look, don't the things that people are the things that people have said of you, those words that have stuck to you, the persecution that you've already experienced in the darkness, don't let that be a reason for you not stepping out again. Don't fear, he says, because I know about it. I might not know, but God knows. That's encouraging, right? Don't fear, he says. Don't worry what they say. Don't fear because I know about it and I'll make it right. I'll make it right. And then he uses this verse, verse 28, as an encouragement for us. Uh, it's a bizarre verse, but it's encouragement. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him, speaking of God, who can destroy both. And the argument here is really, Jesus is saying, when you kind of, get that context, when you take a step back from your trial and your persecution and the suffering that you're experiencing in the moment, when you take that stuff back from that, that personal moment, that actually this life is just a footnote on the eternal story of what God is doing. That actually there is a life to come that is greater and is eternal. And this life, this moment, this day is just a tiny fraction of the overall story. So he's saying, seek good, do mercy, love justice, keep going. Don't let it stop you from sharing the good news about me, he says, because of the tough times. And he's saying there are some things that are just more important than others. And having an eternal view, playing the long game, is more important than our present moment and our, our present suffering and the things that are said of us. It's, it's not a reason not to share, he says because of all the glory that is to come. Actually, getting ourselves right with God, which is what he's saying here, is the single most important thing any of us can do with our entire life. We can do all sorts of amazing things with our life. We can do lots of fearless things with our lives. But getting right with God, he says here, is the most important thing we can do. And I've shared this story before, but I think it fits really well. I don't know if I shared it here or in a a former time, I don't know. Um, so forgive me if you've heard it before, but I think it just brings a bit of context. And it's a true story set in, well, say set, that sounds like it's not real, but happened in 320 AD under the Roman Empire. And it's this story of 40 soldiers who followed Christ. And they're in a massive legion of Roman soldiers. And they're in what is Sebast, which is now modern day Turkey, but was like Armenia, but it's like the East. And they've been serving, and the emperor at the time, and I can't pronounce his surname or his first name or whatever, so we'll just call him Caesar. Um, he puts out a, like a mandate that says, actually, if you are serving me, if you are in my forces, if you are my people, you must bow down and worship me. And you must sacrifice idols to me. And within this legion that's in Sebast, there's 40 Christians who are the best soldiers in the whole troop. 
in the whole battalion, they're the best, they're the sharpest, they're the fittest, they're the healthiest. Everybody loves them because they're lovely people. They're awesome guys. And they have a, a commander who isn't a Christian who watches over them. Um, and again, he's got a, a complicated name, so I'm going to call him Agalius and just say that I was his name. Um, you just got to say it with a bit of confidence, haven't you? And uh, he obviously uh, has to pass on this information to the soldiers. And straight away, these 40 soldiers are saying, well, we're not going to do that because we follow Jesus. I'm not going to fear what you say. I'm just going to crack on and carry on following Jesus. So they don't know what to do with these men. So the story is that they lock up the 40 men. They imprison the 40 men because they're not doing what Caesar has said. And some time goes on and uh, Agalius is waiting, waiting for what the judgment will be from Rome. What do I have to do with these 40 soldiers who are refusing to follow the orders? And the order comes through that they're to be put to death. They're to be killed. But the way that they're to be killed is they're led out onto a frozen lake, completely naked, bound, and just stopped in the middle of a lake. So one cold evening, that's what happens. Agalius takes them to the shore, strips them all off, beats them, binds them, and sends them to the middle of a lake. And these 40 soldiers head out in the freezing temperature to the middle of this lake. And as the evening wears on, the soldiers, uh, the other soldiers who aren't Christians, are on the, on the shore just waiting. And the Romans have constructed a bathhouse at the side of the lake that says, actually, if you denounce your faith, if you turn away from Jesus and you come and you offer sacrifice and you offer idols, there's this beautiful warm bath with bubbles and everything. Matey will be there. It'll be beautiful. And so there's this bathhouse that's there if they would just renounce and softly, because this, this pond, this lake is large, you can hear the, the Agalius who stood with other Romans on the shore starts to hear this noise from the middle of the ice. And it's the sound of these Roman soldiers and they're singing and chanting, 40 soldiers for Christ. And they say over and over again, 40 soldiers for Christ, 40 soldiers for Christ, 40 soldiers for Christ. The evening wears on and there's some movement some movement on the shoreline. One of the soldiers is given in. He comes to the shore, he gets in the bath, and because of the shock from the cold to the warm, after he's in the bath, he dies. And you hear faintly from the center of the ice, 39 soldiers for Christ, 39 soldiers for Christ, 39 soldiers for Christ. And Agalius is stood watching on. And something happens to this man. He has a supernatural moment where he sees the faith. He sees the fearlessness of these disciples of Jesus. And he tears off his clothes and he runs naked to the center of the ice and starts shouting, 40 soldiers for Christ. 40 soldiers for Christ. 40 soldiers for Christ. They come the next morning and they find 40 bodies in the middle of the ice. It's a true story from 320 AD of Christians who did not fear what man could do but look to God instead. It's an amazing story of what fearless discipleship looks like, an extreme story of what fearless discipleship looks like, but amazing nonetheless. Those guys were fearless, not because they were great, but because they knew the love of God was greater. They made a decision. Do we know God loves us and so we'll respond accordingly? Or do we just do our own thing and forget what we know and what we've heard and what we've seen? And they made a decision because of the love of God to just crack on, to carry on, and they're out there on the ice. So to summarize that, the reason I shared that story is don't fear what man says or what man does to you. Because actually we should be prioritizing getting right with God more than getting right with man. Actually, what does God have to say? God's opinion, God's value should be of far more worth to us than what anybody says of us. Both, I want to say both positive and negative. Because they say, don't they, for every negative word you need 10 encouragements. But if we get 10 encouragements all the time, we're going to start thinking we're perfect. <laughs> Actually, whether people say lovely things about us or negative things about us, don't let that define your walk with Jesus. What does God say of me? Well, God loves me. And it's amazing, verse 29. He's just said this amazing verse about fear 
Don't fear man, but fear me. And he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. We go from the depths of hell to amazing hope like that. Not one of them will fall to the ground. But even the hairs on your head, Jesus said, even the hairs on your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. This is the second reason we don't fear. We're valued and loved. More than we will ever know or imagine. We are valued and loved. Do you know a sparrow? I've not got anything, about, anything you know, bad to say about the sparrow, but he's a bit of a nothing bird, isn't he? People are like, oh, I love birds. They're like eagles. You don't put a sparrow on the crest of your badge, do you? If you're a football club. You put like an eagle or a falcon or some kind of bird that eats other birds because they're cool. Sparrows are a bit of a nothing bird. And they were, two of them were sold for a penny in the Roman world. Like that's a really low value. They were next to, they didn't hold any value, next to worthless. But it says here, not even one, not even one falls to the ground apart from your father. I just want you to think about the illustration Jesus brings here. Just on sparrows. Okay, just think about sparrows. So I did a little Googling. Did you know there is a World Sparrow Appreciation Day? Can you believe that? A day set aside to appreciate the sparrow. Sparrows, there's so many breeds, is that the right word? Types subspecies of the sparrow that they actually can't put a figure on how many sparrows there are. Like They don't know how many there are in the whole population of sparrowdom because there are so many of them. They are a very populous bird. And here, Jesus says, not one of them, not one of those millions and millions of sparrows falls to the ground without God knowing about it. Isn't that amazing? Now, that's just sparrows. He cares for eagles, worms, every animal, every insect. And then he says, how much more value, therefore, are we over sparrows? If that's the care he shows for a sparrow, and there's millions, I hesitate to say billions because I don't know, maybe there is, of sparrows, how much more is his care for you? If that's how much interest he takes in a sparrow, what about us. And he says, even the hairs on your head are numbered. Now, there is nobody here, yeah, nobody here, even if we're really short on hair, we still all will have some hair on our heads that knows how many hairs you have on your head. Even Chris, you have got some hair here, haven't you? Yeah, I can see it. You don't know how many are there because there are so many. Yet, Jesus says, God does. An ever-declining number for most of us. But he knows how many hairs are on our heads. Fear not, he says, you are of more value than many sparrows. He doesn't just say you're more value than one sparrow, but a whole heap of sparrows. Doesn't that make you feel good? A whole bunch of them. And since God shows care and love and interest in what we would say are seemingly insignificant creatures, surely he's going to care for his, his people as they do his work. Right? Do you disagree with that? I mean, the logic is flawless, as you would expect for Jesus. Absolutely flawless. He shows care for this, so he shows care for you. We are of incredible value to God. That's why he says, when you take some sick, when you take some stick, don't just, you know, shrivel up, but actually shout it from the rooftops. Carry on telling people about Jesus. Keep going because we are of great value to God. We're image bearers. You know, in the creation story, as God's crafting and making, he makes all these things. He makes trees and fish, and he's like, oh, they're good. This is really good. He gets to humanity and he says, oh, this is very good. With a jewel, with a crown. You know, Jesus didn't come to die for sparrows. Don't know if that's news for you. He didn't come to die for the sparrow, but he came for you. He came to rescue you and us and be raised from the dead. That's how valued we are. That's how loved we are. That's why we don't fear. Because we're loved beyond measure. You know, when we feel down, when we're feeling low, which we do, maybe even this morning we feel like that, Jesus says, you're valuable. Jesus says, you're loved. 
Jesus says, I love you more than anything in the world. That's why I came. That's why I died. That's why I was raised to new life, that we might have relationship with God. Beautiful verses from Romans, nothing in all creation can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So in Jesus, if our faith and our hope and our trust is in that man, the God man, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So we have nothing to fear in all of creation because nothing can drive a wedge between us and God. Nothing can do it. Yes, we live in uncertain times. The world appears chaotic. It might give us the heebie-jeebies when we turn on the news. When we look at what's going on in the world, whether it's we look east, we look west. But you know what? We serve a certain God. We serve a dependable God. We serve a trustworthy God who has always been and will always be and isn't flustered by what happens in the world. Even one sparrow falls to the ground. It's not that he doesn't know about it. He's sovereign, ruling, reigning, and he loves us. We are seriously valuable to God. And that means the words that we share, our mission, is valuable to God. Because that's what we're here to do, to share the good news of Jesus. That's what's going on in this mission. That's what's going on there. They're going from town to town, telling people the good news, bringing the kingdom of God, and they're taking flack. And Jesus says, you're going to take flack because you're with me, but keep going. It's going to hurt, but keep going. I'll tell you why, because I love you. And out of that love, keep going. Not out of a performance, not trying to work to gain love, but you're loved already. So keep going, keep trusting, keep sharing. We've got to hold that eternal view, these two fears that I think stop us from sharing the most. Or maybe we're not a Christian here, and maybe these are a couple of the fears that stop us from committing to following Jesus. What will people think of me? Am I going to be more unpopular? What about the injustice that will be done towards me? And Jesus says, don't worry. One day it's going to be brought into the light and the wrongs will be righted. And then secondly, well, what happens when I'm, I'm hit and I'm hurting and I'm feeling worthless and I'm feeling low? God says, fear not. You're loved. You're cherished. You're valuable. And my personal story is one where growing up in the church was great, but I started as a teenager to look for value and for love and for hope in different places. I'm not saying I, I lived a wild childhood because I didn't. I was quite a good boy in that sense. Wasn't too much trouble, I don't think. But it was when I met Jesus that actually it just fell into place. It's when I met Jesus, I knew I was loved. More than the love that anybody else has ever offered me was the love I found in God. A God who would die upon a cross that I might know him and enjoy him forever. I've never known a love like that. And I tell you, I'll never know a different kind of love than that. And that's the love that actually compels me to share this this morning and can compel us to keep going when it's hard, to lift our eyes to heaven instead of down to the floor because we're loved. And maybe this morning, maybe that's the first time you've ever heard that, that we're loved of God, that we've had a rough week, that we can't trust him with our future. But actually, he loves us enough that he'd send his son. These verses again are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of far more value than many sparrows.